Welcome back to another GTN Coaches Corner where we answer your questions. In this week's show, will a massage gun help with a niggle? Ooh, uh, a question about our race day mindset. The difference between a mid-range and a high-end TT bike. TT bike saddles. And someone struggling with breathlessness in the open water. Right, let's get your questions. We're going to start with a few quick-fire questions on the bike. Firstly, what should I upgrade first, Mark? Uh, I'm going to go wheels. I, I would agree with that. Wheels is probably your best bet. Although, before even your wheels, your tyres, because your tyres can make a huge difference to your power and performance Often in the bike with very little cost involved in them. So, yeah, look at those tyres first. Uh, also, do I need clipless pedals and shoes for a triathlon? No, but yes. <laughs> uh, not, you don't need clipless confusing. pedals, don't need clipless pedals or shoes at all. You can get by with flat pedals and have a very good time, and a lot of people prefer that. However, for performance, clipless pedals, which is when you are actually clipped in. I know it's confusing. There is uh, definitely a performance benefit for using clipless hugely. pedals and shoes. Uh, yeah, And also, actually, uh, sorry this isn't making it that quick, but uh, when you actually start using clippers pedals, you'll realise how little you then end up moving your foot around. You actually feel more comfortable and more secure, which might sound counterintuitive. Yeah, it feels like you're locked into it and you might fall over and be very unstable, but actually the opposite yeah. is true. You'll have another point attached to the bike. That was a bit of a slow, quick fire round. Right, <laughs> on to the first question. Uh, the cat Thickathlon says, hashtag GTN Coaches Corner, I've picked up a bit of a jiggle Ooh. in my right calf. <laughs> Managing at the moment with deep heat, is it worth investing in a massage gun to help with this and general recovery? I'm currently training for an ultra trail run in April. A jiggle, I think most triathletes have a jiggle somewhere or other. Sounds quite fun, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, maybe not Jan Frodeno, he probably doesn't have any jiggles, but the rest of us have jiggles what? somewhere. I think he means a niggle. What are we talking about? Yeah, he's got a niggle, uh, and he needs. He wants to know if your massage gun is going to help him. Uh, mm -hmm. I, okay, so first off, your, uh, your niggle, sorry, uh, could be for a whole host of reasons. It's really important that you identify why you've got that niggle in the first place, what has caused it, and what you need to do to prevent that and recover and rehab from that before yeah. you go and 20 other. And hit it with a massage gun. So the thing with a massage gun is it will massage the area and that may help if the issue is just a knot in the muscle, for example. Pretty much anything else though, your massage gun is not going to do anything. At best, you'll be treating the symptoms and not the cause. So as Mark says, you need to figure out what the cause is first. And at worst, you could have something like a little tear in that calf that is causing your jiggle. And that is definitely not going to be helped by hitting it with a massage gun. So you need to make sure you know what it is first before you start doing any kind of treatment. A massage gun is useful for general recovery and making sure you loosen off tight muscles if you can't get to an actual massage therapist. But use them with caution because I, people tend to overdo them. I would generally say... Um any injury, never use a massage gun on it. It's not yeah. worth the risk. Yeah. That's not what they're intended for either. A massage gun is for when everything's going well and you just want to recover a little bit for the next okay. session. Next one from Sneer J Sneera JP. Uh, they've said, thank you for making this video. Um, this is under our Super Marathons in Seven Days video, James. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they've asked uh, about, about our psychology during high endurance events. Please share our experience and learnings. We got a sneak preview of it in this video, but love to know more about how you go through the harder days and your mindset on race ah, day. This was Ooh. on our how did we do it, the after yes. analysis of our seven marathons in seven days. We spoke a little bit in that video about uh, the mental, the different mental approaches Mark mm -hmm. and I have for our ultra endurance events, where I tend to dissociate and just go off into some space in my head and not think about what I'm doing in the pain for a while before I come back and check in occasionally and then go back what off do and think don't about think about it. Uh, Butterflies and rainbows. Say that in public. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I kind of like to distract myself. Um, it, well, I did during this, for instance, by kind of doing hills and off-road routes and kind of keeping it exciting, my mind sort of distracted in that sense. Obviously, that won't work when I'm put on a race course and I'm told to go in this certain direction. So I tend to, when I'm on a race course, I break it up into chunks and I kind of think of it as bite-sized bits, like get to this point, and, and I think a lot of people do that, and probably yourself. Like yeah, I, that, was, that was definitely the normal strategy, I think. I think there is, there is a little bit of room, especially in long-distance racing, for some mind wandering from some almost switching off for a little while when you know that you've got a long straight road ahead of you and you can stop concentrating 
quite so hard. You kind of save some of that concentration for later on in the event because you cannot, no one can concentrate 100% for an entire long distance triathlon. It's just too long. So you need to almost consciously give yourself mental breaks occasionally before you focus again on really sticking to the numbers or sticking to the pace or sticking to the wheel in front of you, whatever it might be. Uh, it is it is managing that concentration as much as you pace yourself physically uh you need to also pace yourself as far as your mental uh, ability goes and, and your mental concentration because you don't want your mental concentration running out right when it gets really hard later on you almost want to save that for later on in the event that's what, kind of what i used to do in the on the bike once you got onto the bike the first half hour is really frantic and really mm. you really are focusing a lot on exactly what's going on around you and then you've got this kind of almost lull for a for a couple of hours before it starts getting intense about the second half of the bike and close to the run, etc. And in that lull, I would try and give myself a bit of a mental break and just kind of switch off a little bit, enjoy the scenery a little bit, not focus so much on the race and just kind of let yourself relax, saving yourself for later. Have you ever come back moment. round and found yourself in a bar or something? You're like, oh, how did I get here? <laughs> oh, I might as well oh, enjoy okay, it now. No, maybe, no. maybe you switch right. off a little bit too much. Okay. Did that. Uh, next question. This is a really good one, actually, um, from Paul Acorn. Um, Acorn? Alcorn. Um, <laughs> most bike companies offer two different models of triathlon bikes. So, for instance, you've got the Canyon Speedmax CFR and you've got the CFX, CFSLX Cervelo P5 and then you've got the P5. P series and so on and so forth. I understand that aerodynamics and bike performance can vary greatly between individuals, but what is the estimated performance difference between the top and the middle tier models of bikes? I know you guys were Canyon. Anyway, goes on. Um, this is a really good question, um, and it, I guess yeah. Okay, to, to strip this back, yes, you've got the high end bikes with uh, top top spec components on them they're going to cost more. And then you typically get those middle or lower um, end bikes with lower spec components on and they're cheaper. However, just because it's a high end bike and it costs more, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be faster on it. No, not all the time. I mean, your higher end bikes are kind of pushing the limits as far as new technology goes and new shapes go, etc. like that. And it'll work for some people really well, but you almost get like this this curve that gets steeper and steeper, it gets more expensive for less gain the further you go along that curve. Uh, and your middle of the range bikes, for most people, will actually set them up pretty well. There'll be more versatility on your setup, etc. Whereas a high-end bike might be a little bit harder to find your perfect setup, etc. So it may not necessarily be that the, the higher-end bike is faster than you. However, the high-end bikes are faster. Yeah. They have been optimized in every way that the manufacturer can think of to make them as fast as possible and ob obviously still fit as many people as possible. Yeah, so if you, if you put a pro athlete on these top end bikes, they will be quicker. Uh, even a good or a, you know, a, an experienced amateur athlete, they are going to be faster on these top end bikes because the R&D, the frame geometry, or the aerodynamics of it have been really refined. Now to answer your question um, around the, the time saving. So I understand um, from doing a bit of research that on the Speedmax range, with their, if you were to step up to their CFR model, their top model, you could be saving around eight to nine watts. Now, that equates roughly, and this is obviously rough because it depends on the speed that you're traveling at, over an Ironman, around two and a half to three minutes saving over 180K. So that's fairly significant. Yeah, but it's worth bearing in mind that that's with an optimal position exactly. on there. And if you just can't get into that extremely aerodynamic position, you can get almost the same benefits being in a higher position on the middle end, middle of the range bike. Uh, so yeah, if you're not at the very pointy end, probably better off optimizing your position before you optimize the bike that's underneath you. Cool. Hope that answered this question. Yeah. Okay, next question by Harish, Ch Harish Chuan. Uh, hashtag GT and Coaches Corner. Is there a saddle that can be used on a road bike with aero bars and is comfortable enough for whether we're using aero bars or being aero whilst holding the hoods? Yeah, good question. Now, I actually think this also relates to um, just on a TT bike as well, because quite often, you, you well, not always are you right on your aero bars when you're on a TT bike. So I personally quite like to have a saddle that can be used when I'm up on the base bar and on the aero bars. So um, the saddle that you're looking for is more of a road shape saddle but with that cushioning at the front. And there are triathlon saddles or TT saddles that are designed in this way. What you probably want to avoid is those kind of triangle cheese block shaped saddles because 
they are literally just designed for you to be sat on the pointy end of them and in the aero bars. As soon as you sit up, you're going to start feeling or potentially feeling the saddle kind of jamming into the back of your hamstrings. What you also want to look for is a saddle that is almost flat on mm. the top. The ones that are more curved, that have like that curvature for a road saddle to come up at the back, those kind of lock you into a certain position, which is fine if you're staying in that certain position. But if you want to be able to tilt your pelvis forward or back, whether you're sitting up or, or down, you want it to almost be flat so that you can sit anywhere on that on that range. If it's locking you into, into a certain position and then you lean forward, you're going to put a lot of pressure on it certain point that you don't want to put pressure on. So yeah, look for a flatter TT specific saddle with some cushioning in the nose. Okay, next one from Carlos Fleitman. Uh, I'm an open water swimmer. I've done a few 5K and 10K races and did my second Olympic triathlon last week. Yes, in Mexico, we have races in December. The first one was on in October and the swimming got canceled because there was a crocodile in the beach. Anyway, I thought <laughs> I had the swimming nailed, but as soon as I got in the water, I started to become breathless. The water was 20 degrees Celsius Celsius, but yesterday I swam at the same spot and was even colder and didn't have any problems. I think maybe I didn't train enough in my tri suit. Any advice on this issue? I think he was probably worried about the crocodile. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Just flashed into his head and he suddenly uh, was breathing a lot harder. No, it probably wasn't the crocodile. It could have been a tight fitting tri suit or race suit. Just a tiny little bit of compression on your chest can really feel constrictive when you start breathing hard. It, uh, you'd be surprised how much difference it makes. So if you're not used to your tri suit or your wetsuit, uh, then you do need to be uh, spend some time getting used to it because it can really feel restrictive and make it difficult to breathe. Uh, but most likely, it's anxiety mm. and uh, stress of a race start. Don't underestimate how stressed your body is and your mind is. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I know you've come from an open water swimming background, you've done some 5K and 10K races, but a triathlon is very different. Triathletes can sometimes be a little more physical, not intentionally, there just is a bit more knocking, and um, people's kind of swimming in all sorts of directions, sometimes because they're not always quite as good swimmers. Um, and then also, let's not forget, you, you've you also got the bike and run going through your mind. You've probably just spent the morning setting up your transition area. It's just, it's, all those extra stresses mean that when you get to that start line, there's just more stress and anxiety flowing through your body and get in the water. Oof. Also, with all those people around you, it's kind of hard to judge your pace very well. And you may be starting just a little bit too hard. Uh, and it doesn't feel that hard, but after a minute or two, your breathing is really rapid and you're like, whoa, I'm really struggling. There's something wrong with me today. Where really you just overpaced a little bit at the beginning. So be very mindful of how hard you're pushing. Okay, final question from Jigal Lol. Um, my schedule is I have my alarm set for 5 a.m. and usually try and start my session by 5.30 a.m. six days a week with one day rest. I do these sessions without a breakfast before and with nothing but water during the session that will last around 60 minutes. Two hard sessions, four easier zone two sessions. I eat until about two hours before I go to bed the night before and have a big healthy breakfast after session. I feel like if I were to have a gel or sports drink six or seven mornings of the week, I'd be toothless in four years' time. <laughs> Will this approach hurt my training? Okay, well, I mean, I don't think you really need to worry about being toothless in four years' time. Uh, you can rinse your mouth with some fresh water after you've okay. taken a gel or, or an energy bar, uh, and that's not too much of a concern. However, you also don't need to worry too much about getting enough fuel in. You can actually do your early morning session fasted if that's the only way. However, we would suggest that you are probably sacrificing a little bit of performance mm. if you're not taking anything in and doing every single one of them fasted. Uh, you do want some energy just to activate your body's carb stores so that your body goes, actually, we can release some stores here. If you're completely fasted, your body will be very frugal with how much energy it lets you do yet to use for those sessions. I mean, and this you're talking about you know, almost a majority of your training is fasted. You're doing this six days a week, um, the entire year round. Uh, so yeah, as James says, uh, you're potentially hampering your performance a little bit. It's really good though that you're bringing this up. You're clearly aware that it perhaps isn't the best thing to be doing. As James says, get away with uh, doing fasted for a few of those sessions, but anything high intensity, I would personally recommend. And it doesn't need to be necessarily a gel or sports drink. You can try and stomach just a banana, half a banana or half a cereal bar, so you're just getting at least something in, um, but I wouldn't worry too much about sports yeah, drinks worth, and gels. It's worth realizing you don't need to eat as many calories as you're about to burn. You just need to 
give your body something so that it releases those carb stores and goes, okay, I'm, we're not actually mm. in a starvation state here. I don't need to so- save everything. I can release some energy for this particular exercise. Uh, and you just need to trigger that. And you can do that with yeah, a banana, something easy to tolerate and easy to digest, a gel or something, without actually having a whole meal before you go out and train. Yeah, nice one. Well, thanks ever so much for your questions. Uh, please do keep them coming in. Use the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. Uh, thanks again. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.